Right. So we're going to start in English. So here am I with uh, my partner, Mortain Gorsa, to introduce the plot for AI. Yes, quickly, who I am. I'm a privacy uh, engineer, um, an advisor. Uh, we have a consultancy called Right, where we focus spe specifically on privacy engineering uh, questions and responsible AI. And now it's uh, such a big topic. Um, I'm also part of the ENISA uh, organization as a uh, uh, I'm part of the uh, Data Protection Engineering Group as one of the advisors. So for yeah, the ones of you that don't know what really privacy engineering is, it's uh, a lot of uh, technical <laughs> uh, um, yeah, research. This is a way of really uh, approaching privacy and protecting personal data from the technical perspective. So it has a lot of uh, things in common with security. So we look at a lot of encryption and all those things, but you also need to understand the legal part. And uh, yeah, Martin, maybe you want to say something about yourself? <laughs> yeah, my name is Martin Corsa. Um, I don't have such an impressive track record as Isabel, but uh, <laughs> I mainly do security and I'm moving into privacy. And uh, yeah, now that we started our company, uh, also moving into AI. And uh, yeah, today we're here going to present about plot for AI, something Isabel developed. But, um, well, but yeah. first, you're gonna, uh, first I will give a short introduction. introduction. Maybe also, um, this is listed as a talk, uh, but it's going to be much more than a talk. You're going to do some actual work too. We brought uh, the threat modeling library with us, and you'll be able to do some hands-on work in the second part uh, of this presentation. In teams. In so. teams. So it's going to be really fun, I hope. Um, but before that, I want to give a really, really, really small introduction about threat modeling. Um, so first, I would like to know who here knows or understands what threat modeling is. Okay, yeah, about half, really good. And who does threat modeling or has done it in the past? Fewer hands. You go more last. Actually, we all do threat modeling every day. This is a picture I took in the supermarket. Uh, there's cucumbers here. On the right, uh, a bit less than one euro, cucumbers. And on the left, other cucumbers, like 50% more expensive, but they're biological. So they're probably better for your health. So this is the choice that you have. What do you choose? Huh? Uh, it also depends on your risk appetite. And this is when you actually already do some threat modeling. Hey, do I take this risk? Do I find it acceptable? And what is really the risk? So we all do threat modeling at some point. And when you look for threat modeling online, you will go to websites of OWASP or Wikipedia, and you have like really nice definitions of threat modeling. But to me, threat modeling, in its essence, it's really uh, having a mindset to question what can go wrong. So how do you do threat modeling? How do you need to be an, an, an expert for that? Um, in my opinion, you don't really need to be an expert. I think if you, in a professional situation, if you are in a work environment, if you want to do threat modeling and you sit with a really diverse group of stakeholders, you're good to go, having the right mindset, of course. Um, but of course, it does help when there's an expert presence that can like guide it. Um, there's also models that can help you. Uh, Stride is a very um, well-known model. It's uh, developed by Microsoft. And again, if you have an expert there uh, that, that knows how that works, that can guide a session, that, that really helps. Uh, and there's also tools available. So um, but a little bit more about that later. Um, I suspect that most of you all have a background in security, or at least the majority of the audience here. So when you think about threat modeling, you probably think about threat modeling in a security context. Um, and just for the purpose of this really brief introduction, I want to highlight these three aspects, uh, technical aspects, functional aspects, and processes. Uh, what do I mean with that? Like a technical aspect is, for example, encryption. Eh? What kind of encryption do you have? Or do you even have encryption? Uh, functional aspects, you should think about eh? you are developing like a web application and you have a login. So a login is a functional aspect. And with processes, what I mean there is more like business processes. So you might have customers going to your website, they log in, but the customer can also decide not to go to your website, but to call customer service and authenticate themselves there. 
And um, when you look at uh, the usage of tools, oh, oh. <laughs> this was another presentation in another but computer, but we had to switch. So this, thread this we never <laughs> foreseen. Yeah. Uh. Well, should have done some thread modeling here. <laughs> um, when you think about uh, tools, they are usually, I uh, will go back to the previous slide. Oh. Tools are usually really good at the technical aspects. They are less good at the functional aspects, and they are not good at all at, at the processes. Uh, but having that uh, into account, they have some, some, some benefits. Eh? So uh, it's uh, teams that are not so experienced in threat modeling. They really help out there. Uh, it's also they're really good for automation. Um, but some negative aspects is more, uh, I have the feeling they sometimes create, they, they kill the creative mindset eh? because everything is spoon fed. Um, people tend to think less of themselves. So that was security, of course, I've done it like really short. Um, there's also outside of security, threat modeling is also done. Uh, if you look at privacy, uh, Lindun is uh, probably the, the most famous uh, methodology for doing threat modeling. Um, it is sort of a tool, like not really as you have them in security, uh, but it is already much more structured than having just um, a free format session with, with some stakeholders when you sit down. Uh, it really presents you with, with questions and it helps you to think in, in privacy threats. And the reason I'm pointing out Lindun is uh, today we'll be talking about threat modeling in, uh, in AI. For AI. For AI. <laughs> uh, and um, it was inspired by Lindun. So to, to wrap it up, uh, like what I started with, for me, threat modeling is really having a mindset to question what can, can go wrong. Now, AI is very new. Uh, also, the landscape of things that can go wrong, it's, it's very, very diverse, and everyone is still struggling with that. And that is really where plot ai can help. It helps you um, both with having the right mindset, but also it helps you with your education of that very diverse landscape. And uh, yeah, Isabel is going to tell you all about that now. Just a final note, I find it really nice to be here today in the Hacker Hotel. Um, because what do hackers do eh? when something is not available? They look at what is available and they maybe try to convert it, uh, make it something of their own. And that is really what Isabel has done. When she started with this, nothing like this existed. Uh, she took some inspiration like from Lindem and she created something all by herself uh, that yeah, came into this and uh, then also open sourced it so everyone can benefit from it. So if you get excited after this presentation, it's all online, it's all available and everyone can use it. So uh, I now give the word to Thank Isabel. Thank you. <laughs> really nice uh, way of opening the... Well, I'm going to introduce you, I think it's also nice to, to understand a bit how I created plot for ai where does it come from? Also to understand that uh, though it's, uh, it's based on my background in security and then the times of threat modeling, it is much less technical. Uh, you will see now that with, uh, with uh, AI and threat modeling, you really need to look beyond the uh, security threats. Uh, but well, I will start with a, a short introduction. Um, what does it come from? Well, this is plot for AI with eight different categories, 86 uh, different uh, threats. We see threats related to the technical part of uh, AI, and processes involved in the development of AI, but also threats related to accessibility, because sometimes you are developing an AI application and you really need to have in account the way you present certain information, for instance, how is it accessible. There's also threats related to uh, what I call non-compliance, and you will see that some of the names here are these names because they come from Lindum. I will tell you, you will understand now why. Uh, by no compliance, there are really risk related to, yeah, uh, all of regulation, eh? not only privacy, but could be copyright, uh, competition, oh, and there's a lot of stuff that you need to have in account when you are assessing the AI. An awareness that would be a lack of transparency, lack of information, something that now with AI is also quite important. We already had it with the GDPR. Then threats related to ethics uh, and human rights. And there's also a, a section, a category called identifiability and linkability that also comes from Lindum. And it's in case when you're really using AI where personal data can be identifiable, maybe in the, in the training that is set or site model. Then other section related to safety 
another uh, physical safety and another for security. Now, all this information comes from uh, about 200 different sources of, uh, yeah, of information that I've been collecting uh, for the last three years. So this is a three years uh, research. So yeah, this is just to mention a few, but this, uh, if it's, it's, I'm, I'm like a machine, everything that comes uh, on me, I analyze it and I, I start putting it in, in the library, doing the analysis. So with all the information I collected, I classify it and I create a plot for AI. The origins of this, for the ones of you that I guess, uh, I think, how many of you is not aware with the Dutch uh, benefit scandal, or the Duslach affair? You don't know? And can any of you explain him what it was? Floor? Uh, I have to think about uh, The Dutch tax service basically profiled people with risk for hmm. falsely claiming benefits, and uh, the, the risk profiling was based on unlawful categories of personal data, like ethnicity or country of oh. origin of people. It was still, still not resolved. I, I, I could add uh, or, or remove things from your <laughs> comment, but I, I was uh, after the the Tuslag affair. I was hired to analyze uh, what happened here, so the algorithm, the whole process, and to finalize the data privacy impact assessment that had not been uh, finalized by that time. So from that uh, research, uh, of course, came a lot of. Uh, Things, uh, no, yeah, all that is open information. So that uh, the um, report had to be uh, sent to the parliament. So all this is open. But when I was uh, working here, uh, then I realized, you know, I mean, I've been uh, using that modeling and privacy that modeling, like Lintum in software development. But when you really have these difficult sessions developing AI, often really as machine learning. Uh, where do I have to look at it? Eh? You have these real risk uh, sessions, and there's so many things that can go wrong. It's not just going through your, uh, yeah, typical privacy risks or security risks, but it can really go beyond that, and it's really complicated. So that was when I started with the idea. Okay, I. No, I think I went too much forward. <laughs> I, I, I explaining the problem. Eh? The problem you face when you are working in privacy that you need to look at so many risks, like I mentioned, especially when you need to eventually build some responsible AIs. Like, how do you really do it? Because you need to look at yeah, safety, compliance, and, and, and technical risks. So it, it's in place that or you have a lot of knowledge, or you have the right stakeholders on the table, or, and you need, you need to focus. You need to, to understand what you need to look at. And the tools that we have available at this moment, eh, besides the technical tools, of course, for analyzing, eh, to, to do some metrics for fairness, explainability, but that is not enough. You need to look much more there. And, and, and we have some assessment tools, like the ATI, or like now in Netherlands, we have the, the IAMA for fundamental rights. But these type of assessment tools, uh, eh, they all contain a, a list of questions. And if you analyze the questions there, often questions in the in the future, eh? like which model would you be using or, or did you uh, do a pen test? Yeah, but when you're in the design phase, you don't know those things. So it's, it, it, it feels more like a kind of an audit, internal audit tool, or just a checklist and really something you need when you are in the development process. And my experience in this project is, is a lot of uh, noise going on, everybody discussing, the, the, you see the, the data scientist teams that start doing their thing, the business keep discussing, thinking how much can we get out of this. I wanted to focus, make it short, uh, really like we work in, uh, in the agile uh, method, just simply clarity, focus, with teamwork, and uh, yeah, also with a bit of fun, eh? not this recession so boring hours that you don't know. So that's how I came up with the idea of um, let's extend Lindum. So I'm really fan of threat modeling. I'm really aware of their yeah all the added value. I like Lindum. And I think why not to make Lindum that is more for software development, more uh, uh, to to develop it into really AI. So I know also the researchers because Lindum has been created by the Kaiser University in Belgium, and. Uh, uh, 
well, one of the researchers is uh, one of my friends too, so I happen to be involved in the whole development process so that they knew, hey, this is what I'm doing now with Lindum. So it's a uh, Lindum is also open source, so that you know I'm adjusting ad ad to for AI. And here you see some of the categories that are part of Lindum. What I did was to, uh, based on my analysis, reduce uh, some of them and adapt it to what uh, later will become plot for AI. In 2021, I presented uh, uh, plot for AI that at that time was called Lindum ML, uh, and only had 25 uh, uh, threads. And I presented it with, uh, with Kim Wout, one of the researchers from, uh, from uh, Lindum, in, in, uh, in, a, in a conference in the US. And yeah, what I said, it was really nothing at that moment. And now, yeah, like I said, it became really a yeah, season personality, some name, plot for AI, and it has 86 threads. So as you can see, it keeps evolving. And uh, I wouldn't say, well, we're going to have, how many threads are we going to have here? Because it becomes a lot. Um, yeah, at this moment, eh, I try to combine threads when I see, like, keep doing the analysis, I, um, and it keeps being in 86 threads, luckily. So um, let's see how much can grow this uh, community driven project. Uh, just to mention, all the threads are also categorized uh, during the development life cycle. Okay. So at, uh, when you work with AI, often you work with one uh, uh, methodology. And I don't know if any of you work with uh, an AI project. I know CRIPSDM is the one that we use more often, but I've also worked with SEMA, for instance, if you use SAS. So, and, and you can adapt it. Um, I come up with the idea of making it more simple and just reusing it to design, input, modeling, and, uh, and the output. Because if all stakeholders is more, it's more clear what you really need to, in which phase you are when you are analyzing the risks. And with this picture, yeah, you see that eventually, it, yeah, all the different steps during the development life cycle are, are aligned there. So what you see in all the threads for, from plot for ai uh, there's some icons, and every thread is indicated in which phase of the development life cycle this thread could arise. And uh, my advice is always check during the design phase almost all of them, because uh, it could be that, uh, that they happen. Um, but for the rest, it's some advice uh, there, uh, recommending you maybe this phase or maybe the other. Now, how does it really work? Plot for AI, uh, yeah, it's a set of cards, so it's, it's, it's a gamified. Um, every card, every category has a color. And, and it's also online, so all the threads are also available online. All the cards are online, you can turn them, so it's, it's this, you have the online version and, and the paper version. That is the one we're gonna use today, now in a, during a, one of the games that we're gonna do. So how does it work? You will have a thread modeling session, so you sit together with different stakeholders. Yeah, I don't have a magic uh, tip for who should be on the table. Eh? It really depends on the use case, on the phase. It's really difficult, but try not to be just with the, with the data science team. Um, what I also say, it also depends the type of threats you want to assess. Eh? The, the threats, for instance, related to security in the AI field, they can be quite complex. Some of them, so you really need uh, people on the table that has that knowledge. When it comes, for instance, with threats related to ethics and human rights, eh, the more the merrier. You can really, the diversity is really important in the field. In threat modeling, we often use a data flow diagram. In AI, in my experience, we tend not to use anything. What I, I find a problem because you forget eh, that you, you, you have threats during the input phase and you have phases on the, during the output. What you see in the sessions is that uh, yeah, we tend to think in what the result or the impact could be from the output from the model, but you forget that you still need the data to feed the model. So then uh, it's really good to have in account the whole iterative uh, nature of, uh, of AI. And if you go further than that, yeah, then like in other, any other security threat modeling station, you, you should look at yeah, the integrations. Eh? Also, your third party providers or the APIs you might be using that probably are a lot, but also where all your training uh, data is stored, your models are stored, so then you start really looking 
wider, because then the threats also grow. And then you, you also see that these threats are more the, the normal security threats that we usually have. It's not so different. Now, what we see with plot for ai what I did was uh, uh, all the data I collected, all the possible threats, I, uh, I, I translated them, transformed them into a question in a way that it makes you really reflect. So you have the game, the card, the threat, you get the question direct to you as team, and then you immediately have to give answer yes, no, or I don't know. Or some say yes, others no, then it, you know, immediately this could be a threat, so you mark it as a threat. And in the cards from plot for ai you see the question, you also see on the top the category it belongs to, uh, you see the development life cycle that is recommended, or is recommended that you use the, the card. You see some information related to uh, uh, what really the question means. And the game already gives you the answer, if your answer is yes or no, uh, yeah, you, you could have a threat. And behind the card you have recommendations, so once you turn it, it gives you recommendations on how to solve that, uh, that threat. And it also gives you uh, links to interesting resources, a lot of uh, research papers, and sometimes blogs. So everything is uh, what I've been collecting during the last uh, three years is there. This is just a picture of, uh, of one of the physical cards. So basically the same. And only in the back, of course, the links are through, through you see a QR there. Because, uh, of course, on paper you cannot keep updating the links, but with the QR, yes. So once you go to the QR, it brings you to the website where the card is. Now, it's, it's when we work with Plot for AI, uh, at this stage, we just have a, a spreadsheet with the amount of uh, risk that the, the threat you have, select, you have uh, identified. And then if you uh, have time at that moment, or you can do it later, you could mark this threat as a high risk, medium risk or low risk, just to make it really simple. Eh? In some industries, of course, we work further in the risk assessment, the risk management, but at least uh, in my experience, in these sessions you need to do it quick, and people doesn't like to spend time in analyzing risk. So first, at least, at least a really big step is to identify threats, and then later you can send them to the right person, uh, you create a user story in Jira, whatever you want to do with them, but do some work on your threats that you have identified. This, uh, I think, doesn't work here <laughs> for any reason. That's <laughs> pity, but well. This is in the website of plot for ai um, What you can also see is the assessment tool. So, um, yeah, it works exactly the same as with the cards. So you will select uh, the category you want to, to do threat modeling. Also the, 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 um, the development life cycle phase where you want to, to threat model, and then what you get are the questions with different colors. So per question you go selecting yes, no, or I don't know, and after that you get a report uh, spreadsheet with your threats. So after that you can just share the threat, the, the file, and keep working, uh, saying if that is high risk, medium, uh, low. It's busy, you're going to see that, but in the website, of course, it's, it's all available. And that when you work remote with teams, uh, it's really, really handy. So this is, yeah, of course, we, I couldn't show you, but in the, in the, in the video, we had uh, made a, yeah, a sort of selection, we answered the questions, and this is what we get, a report with the two threads that have been identified. And then, yeah, that you, you move, uh, like usually to year, but well, everybody can do different things here. Now, because we are aware there are 86 threats, uh, threats so that's a lot of, um, yeah, a high learning curve, curve. So we know this also the people, yeah, think, well, it's a lot of threats. How can you really work with so many threats? Uh, we came up with the idea, well, we do like um, a threat every day. So uh, you can just uh, through the website, you can also put it in your, in your phone and await every day. It tells you like today, February 11, you have the threat. We need to use major data to fit our model. So when you click there, then you will see information about that specific thread, and in that way, well, every day you can learn about a, new, a different thread. Because the nice plot for AI is that even if you don't use it for thread modeling, it's a really good uh, knowledge base. There's a lot of knowledge there. But the result after uh, yeah, having worked with uh, plot for AI, 
is that in general, what you see is uh, the organization becomes more mature because you really realize of uh, threats that are even affecting the organization, especially the quality process. Improves collaboration, reduces a lot of rework. So we, have, we have seen projects where after one session we already killed the project. It was really clear that this is not uh, we are not going in the right direction. So, and of course, especially privacy officers get really happy because you have a list of uh, threats identified <laughs> that can be added to the data privacy impact assessment. So everybody's happy there. It's uh, uh, open source, have a Creative Commons uh, license, and, uh, and yeah, it's er everything is in GitHub. So what we said, uh, forecast, collaborate, and uh, yeah, send your feedback. It's uh, just for, uh, for, for all of us. Now in the future, um, plot for AI is, uh, in fact, becoming quite um, famous around the world, and it's been used in a lot of organizations. Um, in some Dutch universities, especially oh yeah, TU Delft, Erasmus Rotterdam, I'm uh, even myself teaching them to engineers, and then some of with some use cases, so that's really really nice to see. And the Dutch municipalities, uh, through the FNG, for instance, we are introducing all the threats from, um, well, not all the ones applicable uh, to the risk assessment tool that they have for all uh, municipalities, so that's also yeah, a good uh, step. And it's recognized, but um, internationally by some authorities as, uh, as one of the AI assessment tools. So, well, I feel, of course, really proud of that. Uh, of that. Uh, we are working towards a more yeah, automated version uh, with eventually some kind of auditing tool. And yeah, always looking for pilots, you know, other companies that want to try it because we see that there's international companies trying and we don't even know <laughs> how they do. So, the, yeah, it's always nice for, for us to know. And now we're gonna practice. So what I would like is that, um, let's see, because ah, I don't have it. Yeah, because we have now different computers. I'm missing uh, information, but okay. Uh, we have two use cases and I'm gonna give it to you. So we are gonna um, work on that design phase. Um, in groups of, let's see, we are 12. Let's do or two groups of six is also okay. Yeah. Well, if you feel more comfortable with three groups of four, I, I don't mind. I'm gonna, we're gonna work on a use case. You're gonna get the information. It's not too much because it's still the design phase. Because you will see that in phase what, in, what in reality what we face a lot with the AI, especially it comes the cool ID and uh, the data scientists are already working on it and. Uh, <laughs> And, and then comes the session during the design phase. And then you see, oh my God, so many things can go wrong here. So I'm gonna give you some cards per group and uh, also the spreadsheet that you can fill in. So you're gonna discuss in the group based on the cards, on the questions in the cards, if it's a possible threat or not. Okay, and then later, well, I hope you there, you can uh, com make some comments or give a comment about the threats you have discovered. So you will see this is different than security threat modeling. Eh? When we are really more looking at the, the attack factors, attack factors here, you uh, really have even questions related to ethics, eh? to things that you really need to think for, and, and not just in knowledge or possibilities here. You have to really think of impact for that could have on other people. So it, it, it requires well, sometimes an effort. So yeah, I hope you enjoy it. It's gonna be probably something different. So if you can sit in groups, probably one, you turn your chairs. Yeah, the use case should be on the screen. No problem. No, it's okay. Let's see. Oh, 
scanned your name. Better you stay into my room. Yes, use case. I will explain you what the use case, of course, now. You had to A. I'm in four To B. You know, to B, I'm going to give you two D. It's a bit more variation. So you have, uh, I believe, yeah, ethics and human rights category. And I'm going to... Well, I'm going to let you choose. Do you want to do also ethics and human rights or compliance or a mix of uh, techniques, accessibility? I'm going to say compliance, but I don't want to spoil the fun for you all of you. I would say not compliance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ethics. ethics. Ethics and human rights? Yes. Yeah, also. Okay. Completely ignore that. Okay, then let's oh, see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To be. The thing that you do like at the end and you like do a checkbox. Okay, so this is the use case I was planning. And this, those are your threads. You can, somebody has to fill in. And I'm going to explain you now what you have to do. Do you have a pen? So you have a company, you are part of a company called eMedical. You listen, <laughs> now to like a school, hey. So you have a company called eMedical, hey, so you are the, the company. You don't have in this case a uh, owner or telling you or a client telling you I want you to build this, but it's your own ID. Hey, because you know, it, it really changes the perspective. Uh, to, to really look at risk. So your company eMedical wants to build an application that can identify risks to suffer certain diseases by analyzing behavior. So you can think in a wearable, for instance, yeah, that is gonna collect different data. You could even have different sensors uh, to, to, uh, to, to um, collect your movement, and that will tell you uh, things related to your behavior and about your health. The benefits you see as company is like uh, the people could take preventive ac actions to avoid getting sick, and doctors could be informed of the risks of their patients, what could help them to apply the right treatment. And so the, here you already have some, some, t some uh, hints about, uh, well, it's not only probably the user, but you already have other third parties that are going to get that data, yeah, like the doctors. Now, there's some role uh, playing here. Uh, I don't know, for the interest of time, how long do we have? It's good. Quarter to five. Quarter to five. Five minutes. No, I think was we have one and a half hours, right? Oh, then we have time. Well, um, I, I, I must say, when, to, when I do a workshop about the broad for AI, and, and of course, in real life, we all have our different functions. So you have uh, the privacy officer, the security engineer, or in the team, the data scientist. But I, I, when I do workshops, uh, for instance, with students, and we go about the role playing, uh, it's for you more to understand being in this role. I would probably have a different opinion when it comes to the question, is this a threat or not? And so that makes it more complex in real life. Now, I give you the opportunity to take a different bed today, to really be a different person, and choose about one of the roles here. But in my experience, I must say, it really takes five minutes, you go back always to yourself. <laughs> so it doesn't work very well, unless we are really strict saying this is a role play game. But today is not really a role play game, so just, oh yeah, to, to add more uh, fun to the game, you can just decide to be somebody different in the team. You don't have to. So. What you will do is you, you go through the questions, you ask the question, and you answer to it. So all of you answer to it. And we have time today, so you have more time to reflect on the answer. In real life, um, when I'm uh, coordinating the sessions, I like to do it really quick. So I time box really the sessions. I just want to see yes, no, or even a face of panic. And then I immediately uh, mark it as a threat. Because you see a lot of uh, the product owners want to, of course, they want their product, the data scientists want uh, another thing, and you don't want discussions because then it becomes a risk uh, session. 
that we are hours discussing and we don't uh, reach consensus. This is just to identify this could be a problem, yes or not, quick. So the more threads we go through, it better. So uh, you can be really strict, really, and time box it uh, really quickly, like one minute per, per answer if you want. But today we are, we are not going to be so strict. So you can really go through the questions and uh, yeah, decide about them, especially because you both have uh, ethics, and often that uh, brings uh, more um, well, yeah, time for reflection. You need more time to give answer to these type of questions. Uh, once you give answer to a question, um, you just mark it in the, in the paper I gave you. Yeah, and then later we're going to discuss about the threats you have identified. And even if you think in solutions or actions or how to solve it, better. So let's see later. So yeah, enjoy the game. Now you can start. Giving you all a card because here is the webcam. You can have a look too. No, I think we want to. Website can talk uh, in, in Spanish there, so you can uh, have a look. Ah, I was dream I was dreaming. No, you're completely right. I also said that to my children. <laughs> That's why I make pictures and I'm gonna read them after one day.
check the clock and see how many minutes. Ik ben ook aan de vlag. Twee stems. Dus twee stems. Wie de hele spel wil kijken, wil gaan naar het bestie. Ja. Dat is het induwen, omdat het gaat om echt de, 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 de gedachten die of makkelijk uitkomt. Dat doe ik de ontwerpfase. Hè? Dus je bent vrij om dingen aan te passen. Maar soms zie je met een vraag meteen: wacht even, dit wordt misschien nog iets. Die moeten we misschien niet uh, doen. Uh, dat is uh, het moment dat de gegevens naar de arts moet. Uh, die moeten wij niet op een manier doen, een hele flow. Omdat dit kan. Uh,
staan dan natuurlijk allemaal links uh, naar meer informatie. Ja. En dus ja, je kan natuurlijk niet op een kaart op je kaart klikken. Dus vandaar dat ik hem uh, bestudeer heb. Lastig. Je, je moet een goede facilitator hebben van de sessie, hè? Ja. Die maar goed begrijpt. Dan kan je snel. Je, je ziet meteen de reactie. Dan, uh, dan, dan is het lastig. Ja. De ACG. Ja. Ja, ik spreid het. Ik spreid het wat geeft. categorie compliance. Dus die biedt ook heel veel wetgeving. Hè? Je hebt heel veel van de ACG, je hebt uh, als contracten met de reportij dat heel vaak worden vergeten. Ja, in die soort situaties zit dan ook vaak om uh, de privacy officer en met andere collega's. En dan kom je misschien dat je uh, misschien bouw je de applicatie en je weet, uh, oh ja, maar ik gebruik uh, de reportij software. En voor de privacy officer is het dan, hey, dan moeten wij een contract hebben met die partij. Of, dus en dan zijn jullie allemaal nodig in die discussie. Dus uh, daarom. Dus uh, voor de juiste van, dit is een andere taal. Voor de privacy officer is het, het is belangrijk dat de, de communicatie. Definitie van passieve dossier is ook een beetje. Uh, dan moet je ook. Uh, ja, nou ja. Dat is dan een andere wetgeving, maar uh, dat is ook allemaal regelgeving. Maar ja, in dit geval natuurlijk, hè, als je geen gaan ook mee houdt, hè, dan ga je onderdeel van jouw. Van, van jouw passieve dossier. En dan moet je echt voldoen aan andere. Dan kan je ook beslissen, de geen is misschien van iemand houdt het. Dan blijft het gewoon voor de persoon uh, beschikbaar. Hè? Sommige dingen worden meer complex. Dan kan je zien, sessie, merkje, dit wordt te complex. Dan gaan we nu in stukjes. Hè? We gaan nu bouwen dat het alleen maar voor de gebruiker is. Dus het moment dat hij naar de huis uh, is, gaat dan is andere development. Uh, ik denk dat zijn niet dezelfde, maar dit zijn wel verschillende. Ja, het zijn verschillende kaartjes. Ze kijken naar ethiek aan uh, mensenrechten. En ze, ze willen ook ethiek aan mensenrechten. Ik, ik heb hier gewoon compliance geschreven, maar je kan ook anders. Ja, ja, ja omdat die ze. Dat ze vier kan fout gaan. Dus dan moet je vanaf verschillende. Eh? Ja, ik ga sowieso vragen dat. Uh, ja, feedback van Schrippen. En dan gaan wij uh, een beetje een discussie. Uh, ja. Ah. Ja, want zij hebben sowieso geen microfoon. Dus, uh, tenzij dat ik moet net die uh, geven. Ja, maar ik moet wel maar tien minuten. Ik ga kijken hoe ver zijn ze met de zet en dan kunnen wij wisselen of zo.
speak to the administrator. In the show, for India? No. Yeah, I can admit.
op die moment, ik, ik heb met Linda, met Linda Haas, zij is nu weer pa. Dus ik, uh, wij gaan kijken of ze samen met Linda... Maar we gaan sowieso een hackathon doen uh, in uh, maart of juni. Dus ja, ja in de Oefa, nou, omdat wij hebben een, een dagje in de week een kantoortje daar. En dan uh, zitten we altijd heel veel dingen te, te doen. En, uh, Sinds vorige week ook weer, Celine is uh, ja, heel bezig. Ik heb dan nog een beetje een uh, lichtere manier van het verhaal. Ik had na de dag dat ik weg ging, belde ik een buurvrouw die zei van nou, ik moet daar en daar naartoe. Ik zeg, ja, ik moet naar huis. Ik zeg, bel even terug. Uh, ja, dat heb ik, uh, uh, heb je ook die uh, artikel van Joris Krijs uh, gezien, zijn taal, dat hij zeg maar, dat lastig is om weer te gaan zijn. Nou, ja, dat is maar natuurlijk... Uh, oh, ja, in de praktijk, wat je ziet, kijk, als jij ziet van de UK, dan ben ik shock. Niet, niet algoritme, dat is een andere naam, maar ja, ik zeg, oh, dat is, dat is heel mooi, want is de hele, dat is gebruikt door de Reuters. Ja. Ik denk dat je het kunnen zien. Ja, ja het is bijna, ik moet nog met Gerard, ik zit heel, ik ken je Gerard Gaina. Ja, ja, ik werk samen met Gerard en dan uh, met Sanda en met Marijn. Ik weet niet of het nog al in Eva helemaal is, want ik ben nog steeds met de echo samen met Gerda, maar het komt wel uh, in Eva. Ja, aangepast, want niet alle bedreigingen zijn zo. Uh. Zit je ook bij de coalitie? Ik ben bij de Nederlandse coalitie. Zit je ook daar bij de... Ja. ja. ja want wij ook... Wij ook zitten ook bij de coalitie. Ja, we, gaan niet, we zijn niet altijd aanwezig, maar, maar ja. ja. Ah, misschien zijn wij elkaar de volgende... Ja, zeker. Ja, wij gaan uh, een beetje een discussie uh, uh, op gaan achter, denk ik. Zo. So. Should we share our findings? Maybe it's nice to share what did you find. Uh, if you dare, <laughs> one living. So that problem is here. It's like a. Are we. Are you guys ready to share your findings? Yeah. To listen. Oh. Okay. Why? Well, I think you can. Ah, yeah. You can just. With the, yeah. Yeah. That's fine. So, are you prepared to share? What did you find? Of uh, how many threats did you find from your sets? Who wants to start? Ah, so you even classify it. Wow. Very good. So everything was a threat, according to you. So. We are very careful. Yeah. Uh, Let's we had see. The, uh, number one, the uh, AI system has an adverse impact on society at large. We are high risk uh, for several reasons. First of all, it's very easy to ask specific queries to these models to get data on specific persons and people. Mm -hmm. uh, also, it could be used for insurance uh, adjustments um, or whether you do hire or not hire someone based on their health, so uh, we have that one at high. Uh, number two, the QDI system have a big impact, impact on decisions regarding the rights of life. We also have on high because there's so many uh, uh, things that, for example, if you're old, uh, do, you, do you or you not give medicine to someone that's already old, that's very expensive, or an operation? Or yeah, but also the output could not be correct, and if that goes to the doctor and he has to take a decision about your treatment, so, yeah. well, still you will have the human oversight there, but... Yeah, um, but uh, also keep in mind that doctors will use the system as an excuse to make your decision. Like, uh, as in, uh, you, you kind of expect the doctor to be the final, the, the, well, take a look at the eye, mm -hmm. make a decision, but it's also sometimes will be the other way around. Like, they have an AI that just uh, tells a random thing and the doctor looks at it 
Well, I, I told me to do that. Whatever, let's do that. Ah, so well, you are, you are challenging, uh, yeah, one way or the other. The, 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 uh, every person in every profession across any mm -hmm. field, if if they can remove responsibility from them and give it to some machine like AI, they will do it. Yeah, so you are challenging one way or the other liability. Yeah. This is already a really big issue in AI, and uh, well, there's now directives, regulations being built, our new white paper, the European Commission is working on creating some liability uh, uh, directive for, uh, for, for, you, uh, nah, for Europe. Um, and you are also challenging uh, the kind of the automation bias of the, that is what we call one uh, of the decisions. If the decisions made by the, the in, in this case, by the doctors are really, well, yeah. You're giving neutral and you're really, fair. You're really giving the doctor an ability to ignore the case and just take AI for an answer. Ah, so you will, uh, you will in that case, could uh, have some kind of issue of bias in different stages that you will yeah. need to tackle. Eh? From the, the way you, the data you are inputting to the, really the modeling, to the output, how it's used, how is that person trained. So you have really a lot of things there to work. Yeah, and that's a really good point because, in fact, there's one thread. This I always say that's the first one you should do in the game always, but that's from the category techniques, so you didn't see it today. It's uh, is, is the task clear? Because so one of the things we face really often, well, also in software development, but especially uh, in in AI, is uh, that uh, there's a lot of uh, everybody's fascinating of the power, of, and then you see the business thinking, well, maybe we could also do this, we could also do that. Yeah, eventually it's just maths, and you have to put it. Uh, you have to have really clear what type of uh, maths and, and algorithm you're gonna use to uh, what type of recipe you have for to get the the cake you wanna eat. To put it like that. So it's really important that the, the really the uh, the success factor to define what do you really need, uh, um, uh, what you really want to achieve. And that's something in practice. It's really uh, whereas in practice it's difficult. What feedback? medium because uh, there are some risks but also it's not they're not different from another human but there might be some decisions that come out of the AI that might have more impact on children like a very heavy medicine that might uh, impact their uh, childhood or mm -hmm. like that. So some decisions that where a doctor could have the empathy to make a decision based on also the empathy uh, and the state of a child and I AI will not will just treat it like a normal uh, yeah, in fact, uh, the question uh, is something I decided to add uh, based on my experience, uh, this thread. So this is not one of uh, all the, my collections. And uh, the fact of it, thinking if what I'm building, it's going to be used by children one way or the other, it can have enormous implications in the whole development, even from having to, uh, to give uh, proper information, to make it accessible in a different way. Uh, comply with different rules eh, in a way that the children can still develop themselves and maybe even participate in the development. Eh? That's, 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 uh, in terms of uh, compliance, those are some things you, you need to comply uh, with. And in fact, this, um, yes, funny, but a couple of days ago, there was a, a product uh, from a company called Replica that has been banned in Italy. So there was, a, uh, I believe, it was a chatbot and was giving, uh, I think, like emotional uh, therapy. So you could sort of talk to him or her, or I don't know where it is, and, and, and show you, um, give you some kind of um, comfort. Uh, but this company had never um, thought that it could be used also by children. And the Data Privacy Authority from Italy did some, run some tests on this chatbot, and they saw that, that yeah, it was really not meant for children, and even sometimes got feedback that was, well, not from the proper language uh, for a child. So they said, well, you have not done your due diligence here, so we really bound the tool here. And you have, I believe, 20 days to delete all data from uh, Italian citizens and to work on, the, on a proper solution. So come back once you have done your work. So as you see, if you see a thread like this when you are in the development life cycle and the design phase, it already and put you a step back and say, well, let's re go to the drawing table and think again how we're going to do this. Because not having it in account could really kill the whole project, like we see nowadays uh, more and more. Well, but here it's also decision-based. Like, if we decide our product to be for children, we have to train children, which is, have to give them about 
Yeah, the, the nice of having the thread there for you is that it makes you realize, okay, it's not going to be for children, so let's act on that and document that it's not for children, but we also take measures to avoid children is going to use it, to avoid risks for them. So you are conscious of a risk and you take some mitigation measures, what already puts you in a much better position if something happens, that of course risk, you know, you, you cannot 100% uh, be covered from all risks. So, more... Yeah, there is the AI system with some different rules as well without creating ambiguity. I think we could be uh, in a bit uh, where I think it's really just plot tool now to the market. But uh, we have a medium because, I mean, there's not really anything without ambiguity about, except for mathematics. So you, you always have that risk uh, that the output will be ambi uh, ambiguous. Mm -hmm. What is the question again? What was the threat? The, uh, can our AI system represent different norms and values without creating ambiguity? Okay. So, uh, I, th I don't know where we put it off medium. Yeah, and you need to realize when you have this type of questions from the ethical part, you also need to check the, the technical part. Eh? Yeah. Yeah, so you want to be fair, you have to be representative, and you need to realize in which context you are releasing certain applications. So coming with the idea of uh, let's just build something that uh, everybody could use, or well, maybe that is not the case. Uh, and, and that affects all your product, eh, even to the price. And you, you, so it's not only in the development life cycle, but, uh, but it's good to think, and especially with AI, we also see that there we develop based on uh, data that we have, often just open data that is available somewhere, and when we want to put that into production, it's not working. So you need to keep monitoring, validating your model, you need to, and, and that's something that, even in practice, in my experience, is not done. So, we have then we 10 minutes left, so maybe we should also give an opportunity. Yeah, but I think uh, that was all right. No, there's uh, two questions. Yeah, so quickly, quickly. Uh, maybe in training data, the subjectivity of well-being, we added that low, because uh, you need trained professionals to make this data set anyway, so there's no uh, low case. Uh, yeah, th th this is about labeling data. Yeah. Right, yeah, there's a threat. Uh, yeah, asking if the, the data that you are using, in case you use a, a supervised model with uh, label data, of course, I mean, you could use other type of uh, technology. But in that case, um, what we see now, the trend is a lot of no, yeah, countries, especially in, uh, in undeveloped countries, uh, that where they have really a uh, really big uh, workforce working on labeling data, underpaid on the really bad conditions. And that is something that, yeah, from a human rights per perspective, we try to also put uh, there on the spotlight, like this is happening, so really good, we need label data, but... For like a couple of years, and then they're automated away, so... Uh, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, for you as organization to say, to decide, uh, do I want to participate in that or, or, or not? Do I want to... But it's, it's more uh, as organization, your own reputation, your own, the way you see yourself, uh, that could also be a threat. And the last one? We are at high, uh, uh, could our AI system automatically label or categorize people? Um, they will definitely have some extreme biases in there. You always have extreme biases in your set like this. So it's possible to remove them. Uh, so it's a level of high risk. Uh. Yeah, and in this case, uh, it is something uh, that you might try to prevent uh, during the, the first phases of development. Uh, you try to, to, to clear your bias in your models. You try to represent all populations that you think uh, should be represented. And still, it could happen that with the outputs you see that other groups appear. So you have to keep monitoring, monitoring and doing the um, bias tests and other type of metrics but to I see. Mean, in this case, that's actually more of a goal of a project. You want to identify and categorize people like this person will die tomorrow, this person will die in two years. Well, but why and people? Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, no, I mean, that, that, yeah, but look, that is already related to the question, what is your task? Yeah. Is your task really create categories of um, health status, to put it like that? Or is your task just to give a sign when something could go wrong with yourself so that you can uh, take, but, but because it's not the same. Yes, but you could use signs to really to categorize people. You could, and, and then it's, it's up to you to say, well, we are not going to do that. So we are not going to have a different purpose. Yeah, but that's why the task is really important. You said, what do we really want to do now? And uh, later, that of course, you can do different analysis, yes, but then it's a different purpose. So. Because you can start labeling things that are not in your intended uh, scope. If you just want to see, does someone have breast cancer or not? 
Uh, you might also accidentally uh, sort of enable people as a uh, high risk of uh, not... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Your output could be wrong in that sense. Very good. Thank you. Now we move to our next group. Who wants to... Uh, yeah, we <laughs> um, yeah, we just marked everything as a potential threat. We were mostly discussing about how to interpret the question and mm. how many kind of ways we could think of that a threat would uh, mm -hmm. become reality. So the first one, bias and discrimination. Could there be groups who might be disproportionately affected by the outcomes of the AI system? The obvious answer is yes. Yeah, this exactly specific. Intended use, but there's also yeah. unintended ways that, that could mm. be. Uh, yeah, in this specific use case with the medical yeah. information, absolutely, yeah. yes. You want to disproportionately help people who need help. That's kind of the point. Of yeah, and also be conscious of the data you are using if you are training models, because often it comes from countries, for instance, with only certain ethnicities are represented, for instance, or you have more data from men or from women or more from children. So, and then you realize that uh, what you are really getting is, is not uh, the right output. And can we expect mostly positive reactions from the users or individuals? And we had a lot of debate about who exactly, like, who the scope is, but yes. And uh, how many pop-ups we should have on the screen yeah. at the same time? It depends on uh, transparency beforehand yeah. and the shock when people read about it in the newspaper, when they mm -hmm. don't know about it, and all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, could right. the AI system affect the freedom of its users? Um, I think for me personally, the uh, question is wrong. It should be mm -hmm. not the users who are the doctors, but mostly the patients who the, uh, the, the system is modeling. Yeah, but on the other hand, if you are creating a wearable, the user will be the user, really the patient. It was yeah? phrased as advising the doctors but and monitoring the patients so do you but at least yeah we, the, this, the the questions might be more I'm, i would say the data subjects instead of the user but that's more a professional bias uh, yeah but i understand because of course i was in the privacy yeah. corner so i know probably what you mean um, but also for patients yes all kinds of biases and um, uh, false positives, false negatives uh, could affect the freedom, like unintended, like unnecessary hospitalization. Uh, yeah, but even you could go further than thinking behavior. Yeah, like, like, like for instance, the, the, when, when, when the creators of uh, I don't know Facebook or all those things uh, of TikTok, uh, they launched something on the market. I, I wonder if they thought we're going to change the life of all children. That is the only thing they do now is all day or doing dances uh, to be on TikTok. Yeah, but it can really change a whole generation. So if you are offering a product like that, that everybody who a lot of people like to use, and, and you give it a really good price, so more people can use it, so you get more data, eh? so that could be all a strategy. Until what point eh, is you going to change the behavior of people? They want to be correct, they want to be healthy, um, it could affect even the insurance. I mean, it could have a lot of, in the whole journey, affect a lot of different uh, ways the behavior and change society. Always, actually, is that also, uh, always an ethical concern? Uh, if you change the behavior of people? Is it always wrong, or can it also have a... Because you can also eat still positive feedback, right? It's a yeah. positive. Uh, uh. You, you train a model to predict if you got COVID, yes or no, and the, mo and the model is trained to say this certain culture group always has COVID, so you should be in lockdown. In China, you've got this model where mm -hmm. you can look at your screen, orange, red, or, or green. Yeah, there was a black box behind that. So yep. There you got the phrase of the problem. But there can also be, I guess, good cases that ethically they're wrong because you're forcing, basically manipulating people to make certain decisions or choices. Yeah, exactly. But bias. morally, they're probably a good thing. And it's kind of. How do you. Like yeah, but that's why it falls under the category of ethics and human rights, eh? Because ethics keeps being a trade-off and keeps being, I mean, it's nothing unique. So you might think creating a model that makes all of us healthy, it's only good for us. Let's do that. But you also have a right to be free exactly, yeah. and to have a choice yeah, yeah, and to believe in healthy and yeah. to, uh, and so, uh, so how far can you, and, and also that it's not here, but in other cards, for instance, a threat about how your product could be misused 
like for instance by governments for surveillance for manipulation of uh, and, and even uh, being a, um, a threat for democracy uh, like so like where does the, the line where's the line for example or is it uh, or is there like a framework to model your line basically where it should be is that also included in the book for AI? no but it's a good uh, tip to think about something like that so yeah good good tip i will work on that nice Our AI systems affect human autonomy by interfering with the user's decision making in an unintended and undesirable way. I would change the question. Yeah, but you, sir, they deserve. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> unintended, because also the affecting uh, decision making in an intended way can have a big impact. Um, yeah. On, like, it, it doesn't have to be unlawful or something. But, mm -hmm. but in this specific threat, it is really unintended in the sense that how far eh, the output from our model is, could really affect the decision making of somebody without, and, and not in an intended way, but without uh, really. Uh, 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 it, because it, it, it happens because you are sometimes not conscious of things that can go wrong. And sometimes what you, what you get from the output could really, without being your intention, because that was not really your, your task, it's really changing behavior, changing the decision making. And, and, and you, you already have that when you are tagging or labeling things like in these tools like Facebook and all the things that already change behavior of a lot of people. And I wonder if that was the intention, when maybe yes, in that moment. But, but this is more for when you are developing to be conscious that things can go in a different way than you think. Yeah. For intention, there's another card. So okay. I mean, that's where. <laughs> I'd say that the intention of the developer can be a risk for the patient or the doctor. Of course, and that's why diversity of teams and it's always really important. Of course, yeah, that could also be an aid of influence. Yeah. And are we going to collect and use behavioral data to feed the AI? I think that's the design, the, the, the purpose of the Exactly. Design. In this case, it's obvious. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And when you do discover a threat like that, yeah, it's a matter of now let's act on that. What does it mean? What does it mean using behavioral data? What risks do we have there? And especially if it comes from the, uh, the compliance side, you know, well, this means that we probably have to do extra work yes. if we even can do this. Yeah. So. Yeah? Cool. Yeah, well, cool. Yeah, it really is really good. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed the session. But, uh, yeah, you know, Float for AI is, uh, like I mentioned, open source, it's all in GitHub. So if you have tips for improvement, please, uh, through GitHub, or, or you can also send an email. Uh, like I said, this is something I uh, was developing three, re re three years of research uh, just by myself. And um, it worked in practice. I mean, you have seen it, you are able to see. And the, the nice thing is to, when you document things, then you can really act on that. That's the important to discover risks on time. And uh, yeah, like I say, it's a community driven project. So ideally, yeah, we all make it uh, useful for everybody. That, that's, uh, that's the point. And uh, yeah, everything is online, available. Um, but well, um, there's also boxes, like you see there. And, uh, and you can also buy a box. So I sell them by the cost price. So I don't have any benefit from it. Um, so yeah, if any of you is, inter is interested in a box, uh, yeah, I have a couple here. And uh, thank you. Yep. Thank you all. <laughs>